things to do to keep my plants happy. Plus, how to prepare a bed that's just right. And you've met the bugs that eat plants. Today, you'll meet the plants that eat bugs. Things to do today, including planting and transplanting, moving trees and shrubs. So I guess I better stop talking and get busy. The first task I need to tackle is transplanting this shrub. Because as you can see, its current home is crumbling. This is a willow called Hakura Nishiki. In its prime, it's a gorgeous deciduous shrub with green foliage that's mottled with white and sometimes just a hint of pink. It grows well in zones four through nine. It thrives in wet soils and it tolerates vigorous pruning, which is a good thing. Because I'm going to prune it vigorously to make it more manageable, cutting the top growth down to about a foot. I'll then use a shovel to loosen the root ball, wiggle it out and loosen it from the sides of the container, and then lift it right out. And with that done, I'll give this baby a new home in a spot that receives filtered morning sun and afternoon shade. You see, another name for Hakura Nishiki is dappled willow. Now, the term dappled may actually refer to the coloration of its foliage, but it also reminds gardeners that this plant prefers dappled over direct light. Oh, and as for the pot, well, it's obviously seen better days. Up next is this Japanese maple, which is also in need of a new home after having been in this wooden box for about three years. And here's a problem. The roots have grown out of the box and into the soil below, which means I've got to be careful. What I'll do is dig up the roots that are growing into the soil to free up the root ball. Then I'll move the whole thing, tree, box, and all, into a wheelbarrow. Once there, I'll carefully dismantle what's left of the box, doing my best to avoid damaging too many roots. And once the tree is freed from its container, I'll plop it in the ground. Oh yeah, this is a good spot. Surrounded here by these oak leaf hydrangeas, there's still plenty of room for the maple to grow. There's plenty of shade, and I've got irrigation in this bed as well. Before moving on, I'll prune out any dead wood, which is easy to distinguish from live wood because live wood is green and dead wood is gray and appears, well, dead. And now it's time to put a few plants in pots. In particular, several of these cool little conifers that I received as gifts last fall from a friend and fellow plant fanatic who lives in Woodstock, Illinois and overwintered here in this bed. Now to tell you the truth, I have no idea how some of these plants are gonna perform here in my neck of the woods, especially since a summer in Oklahoma can be a whole lot hotter than a summer in Northern Illinois. So just to be on the safe side, I'm going to put these cuties in clay pots and place them on the patio. That way I can move them around if necessary and experiment with how much sun or shade they need. Then when I'm satisfied that I understand the plant's needs, I can find them a permanent home somewhere in my landscape. For these evergreens, I've already found a home. It's these brick planters. I struggled for years over what to put in these planters. Then one day I decided just to stick some azaleas in them. Well, as luck would have it, a giant tree that once shaded this whole area fell, and it turned what was once a really shady spot into a really sunny spot. So now I have no choice but to remove the azaleas, which can't tolerate full sun. And in their place, I've decided to plant these junipers roughly three feet apart. These beauties grow well in zones three through nine and they retain their color through the winter, which is something a lot of gold evergreens don't do. These are compact plants growing roughly three feet wide and tall and they do great in full sun. I've actually planted two junipers here. One is called Gold Coast. The other is Paul's Treasure which is nothing more than an improved variety of Gold Coast that has absolutely nothing to do with me. And you know what? Unless you're a real juniper expert, you'll probably never notice the difference. But anyway, once planted, I'll add a bit of mulch to the bed, water the plants well, and pat myself on the back for a job well done. You know, these plants look great all by themselves, but what I really love is the way the gold foliage of the junipers contrasts with the red foliage of the Japanese maple. Oh, it's a stunning combination and I love it. I think I'll pat myself on the back again. My last task involves moving a prized plant of mine outdoors, one that spent the winter in my garage. 
This is a plumeria, a tropical beauty that's ready for a hefty dose of some sunshine. Now, I know it doesn't look like much, but once I cut all the brown leaves off, it'll at least look a bit more alive. And to get it off to a good start, I'll add a two-inch layer of compost to the top of the pot and water well. After all, it hasn't had a drink in months. One of the reasons I love plumerias so much is that they remind me of the beauty of the Hawaiian Islands. And trust me, folks, in about three weeks, this plant is going to leap out and be absolutely beautiful. So much so that chances are, <laughs> I'm probably going to want a hula. Coming up next, I've got even more things to do, like some bed preparation. This program brought to you by Ambien C. What you're about to see isn't going to be pretty, and for two reasons. One, it has to do with preparing beds that have been neglected for months. In other words, beds that in their current state aren't particularly pretty. And the other reason it isn't going to be pretty is because, well, it's because I'm in it. Nevertheless, bed preparation is an extremely important task. And pretty or not, it has to be done. I've got several things to do in this bed in preparation for spring planting. And the first thing I need to do is remove some newly emerging clumps of Rudbeckia. Rudbeckia, or black-eyed Susan, is a great flowering perennial, but it does tend to take off and spread. At this young stage in their development, however, the plants are relatively easy to dig up. And once the clumps have been dug up, they can be transplanted elsewhere in the garden, given to friends, or simply tossed in the compost pile. Another plant that tends to spread is Chasmanthium latifolium, or northern sea oats, and it's starting to take over this bed. It, too, can be dug out and transplanted. However, it requires a bit more effort to get the clumps out of the ground, roots and all. And where the sea oats are growing in between rocks, I'll use a screwdriver to pry them out. These little privet shoots probably got started in this bed thanks to birds that eat the seeds from mature plants and deposit them all over the place. When young, these seedlings are easy to pull up. But as they get older, they become much more difficult to remove. And by the way, privet can quickly grow to well over 10 feet tall, so if you don't like it, make sure you pull those seedlings as they appear. Okay, I've gotten rid of everything I don't want growing in this bed. Now it's time to renovate it a bit. And that means pulling back the existing mulch with a steel garden rake, adding a one to two inch layer of compost, putting the old mulch back in place, and adding a fresh layer of mulch to a depth of about three inches. And now this bed is ready to plant. Only problem is the plants I want to put in it aren't at the nursery yet. So I guess I'll just move on to another bed that needs preparing. But you know what? Things are starting to look kind of pretty around here. Well, now they are. In this long bed, things are looking pretty good. The soil is healthy, which means the plants are too. And there's a nice layer of mulch. But there is a problem at ground level. Weeds! And not just any weeds, mind you, but four of the most notorious weeds that grow throughout North America, any one of which can quickly take over your garden and zap water and nutrients from nearby plants. The first culprit is henbit, which just about everyone has in their lawns or gardens. Now, thankfully, henbit is easy to pull or hoe, although you need to make sure you get the roots as well as the top growth. The second is chickweed, which also grows throughout North America. It, too, is easy to pull or hoe, but get after it early in the season to avoid a carpet of chickweed later in the year. Up next is Queen Anne's Lace, a lovely member of the carrot family that's an important source of food for some beneficial insects. Unfortunately, Queen Anne's Lace also reseeds and spreads rampantly, and it can take over your entire yard in no time. So if you choose to grow it, make sure you keep its growth in check. And that means pulling it up, taproot and all, ideally while the plants are young. Lastly, here's the ubiquitous dandelion. It too must be carefully dug out of the ground because any portion of its long taproot that remains in the ground will send up new leaves. You can also control dandelions by constantly pulling their flowers as they form. By removing the flowers, reserved nutrients will ultimately be depleted and the plant will eventually die. And along the way, you can enjoy a lovely bouquet of dandelion flowers and add the edible leaves to a salad. Okay, time now for my next bed preparation project. 
which happens to be here, a narrow planter filled with evergreens. And in this bed, I've got a challenging situation, namely some variegated vinca, a vine I don't want here, growing in and amongst some sweet william, which I want to keep. The challenge is how to go about digging up the vinca without damaging the sweet william. Well, actually, it's not that big a challenge. Here, let me show you what I'm going to do. First, I'll tug on the vinca vines until I get to a spot where the vine is rooted. I'll then tug on the roots gently, trying not to disturb the sweet william. And where the sweet william does lift out of the ground, I'll just stick it back in and pack the soil lightly around it. Thankfully, sweet william is a very forgiving plant that roots easily. In fact, you can take cuttings, stick them in water, wait till they root, and then set them out in the garden anywhere you want. And with that task completed, I'll apply a fresh layer of mulch to the bed. Bed preparation can be done anytime, although it's most often a late winter to early spring project. That's when the soil is most in need of enrichment with compost, the mulch needs to be replenished, and the weeds need to be eliminated. And when all my beds are done, I get a certain sense of gratification for a job well done, and a feeling of anticipation for all the things that the new growing season has to offer. Of course, I also get one more feeling, namely that there's one more bed I need to prepare. Coming up next, this is cool, but it might also make you queasy. Plants that are both beauty and beast. Insects will climb into the trap drinking the nectar, and this is what happens. We'll meet carnivorous plants, the meat eaters of flora. Check out over 1,000 designer ideas for your home. Get right to the meat of the matter, folks. Digestion isn't usually a topic on this show. Unless, of course, it's about me chowing down on some garlic, onions, and taters. But today, all that changes as we show you a collection of fascinating flesh-eating flora. So, let's get ready to sink our teeth into the interesting world of carnivorous plants. Gorgeous or ghastly? Regal or wretched? Delicate or demonic? Make no bones about it. The extremes in the world of carnivorous plants are many. However, one thing is constant. Some creatures are just dying to get in. Carnivorous plants are plants that have adapted to lure, catch, kill, and eat uh, insects and other animal life uh, for nutrients. Most carnivorous plants in the wild grow in wet bogs or swamps where slow-moving water carries nutrients away from the roots. To survive, they've adapted to catching their food source, usually sporting legs or wings. You see this fly? It's discovering the intoxicating nectar around the lip of an American pitcher plant. Peter says sometimes insects get so drunk on the stuff, you can actually pet them. Whoops, he got away. But wait till you see the ones that don't. The insides of the leaves are smooth and waxy, so bugs can crawl in, but they can't crawl out. American pitcher plants are ravenous pigs, as we'll soon find out when we perform an autopsy on this pitcher leaf. And it's really startling to see what it is that they've been catching. Okay, folks, this is both creepy and eerily interesting. But if you get queasy, you might want to turn away for a moment, because it's also pretty gross. Oh, look at this. These look like they're mostly house flies, bees. Uh, there's some earwigs in here. Carnivorous gluttons of the plant world. What you see are mostly insect exoskeletons. Everything else has been liquefied by acids and enzymes the plant produces, then absorbed through the leaves. Growing outdoors, mealtimes are around-the-clock smorgasbords for these bottomless pits. One of the more well-known carnivorous plants, the Venus flytrap, has trigger hairs inside each leaf that detect prey. A bug that touches two within 20 seconds of each other is toast. As it snaps shut, the cells on the outside of the leaf instantly elongate, creating a cozy convex prison. After digestion, the traps will often turn black, and you can feel free to trim away any old black leaves. During the growing season, the flytrap will continually produce 
new leaves to replace the old dying ones. Check out these sundews. Hundreds of tentacles on each leaf are topped with a gluey substance that sparkles like dew. Thirsty insects get super glued in place as the tentacles wrap around the bug and suck the juices out. A week later, the only thing left is critter litter. And butterworts have flypaper-like leaves. Fleas and gnats jump on them and are digested right where they land. Gruesome? Well, sure, but carnivorous plants are spellbinding as well. And the best part for enthusiasts, they can be grown all over the country. They grow around the Great Lakes. They're found in Canada. They're found in beautiful exotic places like New Jersey. Um, most of them are in the southeastern United States. Peter has some food for thought on planting and growing carnivorous plants. Most love wet soil, so two containers are often better than one. A larger vessel holds water. Inside that goes the potted plant. Glazed, ceramic, and plastic pots work well. One thing you definitely want to avoid are terracotta unglazed pots. They absorb too many salts, water evaporates too quickly from them, and they also develop a lot of algae slime that's very difficult to wash off. Carnivorous plants should not be transplanted often. Wait until they're bulging at the seams, then go for it. Peat moss, perlite, and sphagnum moss is about all you'll need. The whole purpose of using these soils is that they are very low in nutrients. Um, carnivorous plants catch their minerals. They don't want rich houseplant soil. They don't want fertilizers in the soil. The sphagnum moss needs to be soaked in purified water, as does the perlite to keep the dust down while mixing. Into one part perlite, Peter mixes one part peat moss and more purified water. And then it's kind of like making a mud pie. You want to get all the lumps out. Now, we don't want our peat and perlite to run out through the holes. So this is why we soak the sphagnum moss and we're going to put a big wad of sphagnum moss down here. Mush the sphagnum down tightly. And then we slop in our pre-soaked peat moss and perlite. Then pack the soil up to the top of the pot. Make an opening big enough for the plant and transplant. Set the plant on a humid, sunny patio. Keep the water bowl filled with an inch or more of water and enjoy. Or cringe, as the case may be. Now, if this story seems a little cold-blooded, well, that reminds me, carnivorous plants need winter dormancy. You may need to move it to a colder room of your house or perhaps a garage windowsill for the winter. If your winters are too cold, place the plants outdoors. So you see, on the botanical food chain, carnivorous plants are carving a nice niche for themselves. One word of warning, though, They've been known to lure more than just bugs. It's true, uh, growing carnivorous plants is more like having a pet rather than a house plant. They're so animalistic, that's why I think people get attached to them. Killer story. You know, Peter's such an authority on carnivorous plants that he's actually had one named in his honor. Nepenthes Peter D'Amato. Next on Gardening by the Yard, I'm absolutely manic about maples. Japanese maples, that is. A look at my favorite trees. It's when people ask me to name my favorite plant or plant group, I always struggle with an answer, largely because I love so many different plants. I'm crazy about conifers. I go gaga over grasses. But at the moment, I'm absolutely manic about maples. Japanese maples, that is. After all, they're just so unbelievably beautiful, especially early in the season, that they're impossible to ignore. So I thought you deserved a visual tour of the Japanese maples here in my landscape, all of which are at their prime. And along the way, I'm gonna skip Latin names and common names for that matter, so that you can simply admire them. Japanese maples are available in two basic forms, those that grow upright and those that cascade. The upright forms rarely grow taller than 25 feet or so, while the cascading forms are typically trained to begin weeping at heights ranging from three to six feet. Leaf colors vary, although green and red are certainly the most common. The red-leaved varieties actually color up best when exposed to some sun, although all Japanese maples tend to prefer shade or at least protection from afternoon sun, especially in the south. 
Leaf shape is perhaps the most interesting variable of all. And while five to seven lobed leaves can be stunning, those with leaves dissected in up to 11 lobes, the so-called thread leaf varieties, are even more spectacular. And leaf texture can vary as well, from smooth to crinkly. Japanese maples are actually quite easy to grow, and they're hardy to zone five. They do require good soil, and absolutely will not thrive in heavy clay soils. Now, they do need a soil that drains well, but retains some moisture. However, they don't need supplemental fertilizer, and they're rarely bothered by pests and diseases. And because they're such standouts in the landscape, they make great specimen plants. They even grow well in containers, at least for a few years. So if you're wondering what to put in that special place in your landscape, make it a Japanese maple. And who knows, it just might become your favorite plant. That's it for today. But remember, if you'd like to learn more about anything you've seen on today's show, just log on to our website. I'm Paul James, the Gardener Guy for Gardening by the Yard. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.